So in our program tonight, we're going to be talking about just that. We're going to talk about what vegetables grow well over the winter months here in Contra Costa County, when is a good time to plan, plant them, and how to solve some common pest problems that these winter veggies sometimes see. Um, you'll also find out why it's really important to fill any empty beds that you have over the uh, winter months so that uh, we're going to teach you a little bit about cover crops so you'll have even greater success for your next summer's vegetable. Always looking ahead. Um, and to share all this great information tonight is um, Terry Lippert. She became a master gardener in 2010 after retiring from her career as a corporate attorney. She has been very active uh, since joining in our master gardener program. She has achieved our platinum bad status, uh, which um, is given out to those volunteers who volunteer 2,500 hours. And since then, she's uh, accrued uh, an additional 700 volunteer hours. Terry's been growing vegetables and fruit year round in the Bay Area for over 25 years. And she's a regular presenter to library talks like this in person on webinars, as well as through our Growing Gardeners program. Um, Terry also was previously the coordinator for our help desk, uh, which we'll, you'll learn about at the end of our program. And she still continues to spend at least one day a week answering um, all of the questions from our colleagues and our friends here in Contra Costa County. So before I officially give the uh, virtual floor to Terry, we're going to go into our first um, poll of the evening. So let me launch this poll for you. So we want to know what your experience has been with vegetable gardening in the winter. We're curious, have you grown vegetables in the winter month? You could check all that apply and here are your choices. I currently am growing winter vegetables. That's awesome if you've already gotten a start. I've grown vegetables in the winter months for two to five years. I've grown vegetables in the winter for more than five years. You've never grown vegetables in the winter, but you really would like to grow some this year, or you've just decided to let your garden rest for the winter. Go ahead, I see a lot of you are plugging in your answers. We already have, gosh, 150 going strong. <laughs> Give everyone a few more seconds to plug in your answer and we're, we'll see what the results are and then hand it off to Terry to start our great program tonight. All right, we have almost 90% of you voting. So I'm gonna end the poll, a few more squeezed in there and I'm gonna share the results. So it looks like the most popular answer of the evening, 47%, almost half. I've never grown vegetables in the winter months, but I would like to. So all of you have come to the right place this evening. We're gonna give you lots of tips. Um, the next 35%, you're currently growing win winter vegetables. Good for you, you've gotten your head start. 31%, you've grown uh, vegetables for two to five years. 11%, um, more than five years, and a few of you have decided to let uh, your beds rest for the winter. So that is a pretty good mix of folks. I'm going to stop sharing the results, and I'm going to give the floor over to Terry to start the program. Ah, here we go. go. Yay. And we're off. All righty, here we go. So Andrea gave a pretty good overview, but uh, let me just start by uh, thanking everyone for being here. Uh, we do have a nice range of experience. Uh, I will admit, I learned things that I didn't know before uh, when I put this presentation together. So hopefully I've included something that all of you will learn something and have something to take away. Uh, what we're going to talk about, we're going to start with the uh, discussion of managing uh, soil, water, uh, soil aeration, and sun in a winter garden. If you've joined us for our prior webinars on vegetable gardening, you know these are really fundamental to the success in any garden. So we'll talk specifically uh, today about how they apply to a winter garden. Then I'm gonna talk about uh, crops that grow well in Contra Costa. If you live in an adjoining uh, uh, county, uh, just try to pay attention to how your microclimate compares to ours. And I'm sure that uh, you'll be able to do some successful gardening uh, where you live as well. We're gonna talk about when to plant crops uh, for the winter and how to avoid or solve problems. And then we're gonna finish up with cover crops and in particular, why you should plant them, how you plant them and harvest them to maximize the benefits that they can bring to your garden. 
So we're gonna start with this slide. Again, if you've seen our prior webinars, you've seen this slide before. If you haven't seen the prior webinars on vegetable gardening that we presented in conjunction with the library, um, go either to the library's YouTube site or to the Master Gardeners of Contra Costa County's website, uh, uh, YouTube channel, and you'll be able to um, watch those. They went into more detail than I'll be able to spend tonight on the importance of soil, water, aeration, and sun. But what I'm gonna cover is uh, specific to the winter months. Uh, if you watch those uh, prior webinars, you know that uh, healthy soil has uh, billions of, of life, different kinds of life in it. In particular, it has a lot of uh, both fungi and bacteria, some of them can do bad things to your crop, but in a healthy soil, most of them actually contribute in important ways to uh, your growing crops. Uh, and they actually uh, form a symbiotic relationship between the soil and the microbes in the soil and uh, the plants you're growing. Uh, the crops that you're uh, growing uh, photosynthesize to produce sugars that are gonna feed uh, your crops, feed the plants, but they're also sharing those sugars with the microorganisms in your soil. Uh, and in turn, the microorganisms are helping to digest the nutrients that are in your soil, making them more accessible and in forms that your plants can use. Uh, so what you grow in your garden is very important to the healthy soil. Now, right now, probably many of you, if you're interested or are currently doing uh, winter vegetable gardening, chances are you had a summer garden as well. So there's a good chance that if you were growing tomatoes and peppers and other summer crops, uh, that the nutrients in your soil might be uh, a bit uh, depleted at this point. So um, it's a good idea to test uh, your soils for the nutrients. On the right-hand side of the screen, I've uh, put up a copy of kind of a typical soil report that you would get if you had your soils tested at a uh, commercial lab that does that. Um, if you haven't done that before, I really recommend that you do that. Uh, you might not have time before your summer crops because as we'll talk in a few minutes, you kind of got a limited window right now to plant. Uh, so think about doing a uh, commercial soil report. If you go to our Master Gardener website, you'll find a link to lists of uh, labs that do testing. They'll test for all the nutrients. But what you could do right now is to test your soils with a home testing kit to see what they need. I've put up some uh, photos of some of the typical ones, lots of different ones that are out there. Uh, all of the ones that you do yourself uh, will test your uh, soil pH, whether it's acidic or uh, more alkaline. Uh, most of your vegetable crops are going to want a neutral to slightly acidic uh, pH. Then it's also going to test for the N, that's nitrogen. That's what causes the plants to be able to uh, produce nice green foliage. Uh, P stands for phosphorus. That's what really helps your plant produce the vegetable uh, that you're gonna be picking and eating. And then finally is K, potassium. And that's good for overall uh, plant health and for this, uh, for the root structure. Um, I'm gonna predict that if you had a summer garden and you've done no amendments at this point, that you're gonna be deficient in at least nitrogen and phosphorus. And if that turns out to be true, what I recommend that you do before you plant your winter crops would be to add some organic fertilizers. Now, as some of you know, uh, fertilizers, uh, come really in two general forms, either organic. Uh, if they are organic, that means that all of their nutrient sources have been 
derived from plant or animal sources. So for example, uh, blood meal, uh, which actually comes from blood uh, of slaughtered animals is a high source of um, nitrogen for your garden. Uh, if the uh, uh, label uh, of your fertilizer either has the word organic or it has one of the symbols you see on the slide, that means that all of its nutrients are exclusively for plant from plant or animal sources. If they don't say that, they're likely a one that has been uh, manufactured, synthesized from chemicals. Now they can also add uh, in particular the nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium, the, the basic uh, uh, nutrients that all plants need. But the reason I'm going to recommend organic fertilizers for a winter garden is that uh, most chemical uh, fertilizers are highly water soluble. And if as we hope, uh, we get some uh, good rains over the upcoming uh, rainy season, uh, that the risk is that if you've got one of the synthetic fertilizers, that the water that's draining through your soils as it rains is gonna carry a lot of those nutrients away from where the plants can access them and into the groundwater. Uh, the, uh, nutrients that are in an organic fertilizer are gonna be available to your plants more slowly because they're not as highly water soluble, but it also reduces the chance that they're gonna leach out of your soils. If you do have any of the synthetic uh, fertilizers that say on the label that they're either a slow release or a control release, and all the ones on uh, the screen right now are just examples of that. Uh, those are typically synthetic fertilizers, but they've got uh, coatings on them uh, to slow down their water solubility. So if you're gonna use uh, any kind of a synthetic fertilizer uh, in the garden during the winter months when it might be raining, I recommend one of those slow or controlled release types. Okay, the other thing that's closely associated uh, with the, uh, the leaching problem is water. Now, the good news is, particularly if we get um, some rains over the winter months, um, uh, they're gonna take over the job of irrigating uh, your winter garden. Uh, even if we don't get rains and there's none in the forecast uh, uh, right now, and if you're starting your crops or about to start some crops, you're gonna to have to provide some irrigation. But in a winter garden, you're gonna be providing less water to your plants. Uh, just by comparison, uh, let's think about uh, a summer uh, plant that you might've grown, zucchini. Let's imagine it's July, it's in Pleasant Hill, uh, you're growing a zucchini and the plant is presently about two feet uh, in diameter. That zucchini plant is going to need to have approximately uh, two gallons of water every week that you're going to have to provide entirely with the irrigation you provide. Now take a similar size winter vegetable. Let's say you're growing a broccoli and it's uh, uh, two feet wide and it's the first week in November uh, and you still live in Pleasant Hill then you're only gonna to have to provide either by irrigating or if it rains, maybe you don't have to provide any, but the, that plant is only going to need a half a gallon of water. Now, the reason I know that is because I know about a very useful website. Uh, it's called Puddle Stompers Water Wonk, and they have a calculator where if you put in where you live, Pleasant Hill in my case, you put in the uh, approximate size of the vegetable you're growing. You indicate uh, what month it is. Uh, and you indicate in the case of vegetables that it is a high water use plant because all uh, vegetables uh, need high water levels. And then you simply plug in, uh, is it in full sun or partial sun? And it's gonna pop out 
the amount of water that you need to provide per week. Be sure to check uh, from time to time because as my example of two gallons for the zucchini in July versus a half a gallon in November for my same size broccoli, it does vary a great deal. It varies in part because there's less sunshine, less heat, and therefore less evaporation from the um, uh, moisture that is in your soils. The other reason is, is that plants, um, they are photosynthesizing, but they're doing it at a lesser rate during the winter. And some of the moisture from your soils is lost through that process of photosynthesis. The plant takes up water from the roots and as it photosynthesizes, it transpires and that gives up uh, some of the moisture through the leaf cover. That really slows down in the winter. Uh, even though it's gonna uh, require less water, it's really important that you test the moisture levels uh, before you do more irrigation. Uh, now, if it's raining, hopefully you've got your uh, garden well situated so it drains well and uh, doesn't accumulate too much water and you won't have to worry about it. But before you apply more irrigation, uh, check. And I've shown here a couple of ways you can check. Um, I use a meter like the one on the left-hand side uh, with long prongs that go down to the root level. And it'll tell you uh, what the water level is, whether it's too low and you need to irrigate, whether it's just right or whether you have an excessive amount, uh, meaning that you really need to wait and uh, overall apply less. You can also do it by the squeeze test and you don't have to do it right next to your plant. If you've listened to the prior webinars, you know you shouldn't be irrigating just an individual plant with a dripper or two on your drip system. You should be irrigating all of your soils because that helps keep them healthy. So if you're gonna do a squeeze test, you can take your little trowel, dig down adjacent to your plant, down to the root level, uh, five or six inches, take a handful of soil. If it presses together and holds together, like you see in the photo, uh, that's enough water. You don't have to water right now, the plant has adequate moisture. But if you squeeze it and it kind of crumbles apart in your hand, that means uh, the, the soil is dry, it needs more moisture for your plants. And then finally, if you squeeze it and it actually leaks out water, then uh, the garden's got a little bit too much for now, so wait. You can also use a probe like is shown on the lower right-hand side. And that actually takes a column of soil uh, from your garden and then you can examine it to see what the moisture level is at different levels of the soil column. Okay, very related to the watering is the need for aeration. Um, as we've discussed in the prior webinars, a healthy soil is going to have 25 to 35% by volume of simply air structures. Those air structures, like you see in the diagram at the left bottom, is going to provide air source. Your roots actually utilize the air uh, that is in a healthy soil. Uh, those air pockets also will allow for water circulation. But what you want to be sure you don't do is to oversaturate it. You wouldn't want to have a winter garden growing in a location uh, where after a rain, it looks like it does on the right-hand side. What's happening there is it's not draining adequately and all those um, air pockets that should be in your soil are going to fill with water and it will actually drown the plant because the roots won't be able to access the air that they need from the soil. So avoid poor drainage, don't give too much water. Be sure if you've got an automated uh, irrigation system of some type that you turn it off if we start getting regular rains and also avoid doing anything in your garden that might compact the soil. Certainly you don't want to be walking in any of your garden beds. 
But likewise, um, I'm going to tell you later in this presentation that next February is a good time for you to um, plant some of the seedlings that will produce winter crops, like broccoli, for example. But if your soils are very wet because we've had good rains and it's February, wait until they dry out a bit because working the soils is going to compact your soils and destroy the air pockets that you need. And then another good news for those of you who are sun challenged is that generally speaking, winter vegetables need less sunshine than the summer vegetables do. We had the same kind of diagram up for a summer uh, vegetable gardening program that we did in August. And you would have seen that most of the popular summer crops go in that full sun, six to 10 hours. But as you see here, winter crops don't need that much. If you've got it, it's fine. You know, the, the plants will like the additional sunshine, but they don't need it. And by sunshine, uh, particularly in the winter, we may go for a whole week if we have a series of rainstorms coming through where there's no sunshine. Uh, and that's fine. Your plants are going to do fine through that. Uh, what the six to 10 hours or the other uh, measurements on this chart are talking about is on a bright sunny day, how much sunshine would your garden area be receiving? You might know from the summer, if you had a summer garden and were frequently out there observing it at different times of the day, but look again for the winter. With the days being shorter, you may find that the amount of sunshine your garden is getting is less because there's less daylight. And likewise, um, the uh, sun is a little lower on the horizon at this time of year and the shadows might be different. So be sure you check. Uh, but once you check, observe how many hours you're getting. Uh, some of the crops that we're gonna talk about uh, tonight where we eat their immature flowers like a cauliflower or broccoli, or we eat their roots like um, carrots, uh, or we eat their seed pods like uh, sugar snap peas. Those are gonna want um, half sun, four to six hours per day. Uh, if you've got a, a sunnier area, fine. They'll love it, but they don't need it. And then uh, other uh, uh, ones that will grow during the winter, we're eating their leaves. So it's the lettuces, the spinach, but it's also your herb uh, uh, plants. Uh, the things like uh, cilantro. If you've had trouble growing cilantro in the summer because you plant it and two weeks later it's growing flowers and becoming inedible, try it in the winter. It does great. It's too bad we don't have those fresh tomatoes any longer to go with it, but the, uh, it'll grow much better. And it only needs two to four hours of sunlight. Uh, shade, even in the winter, if you've got an area that never sees sunshine, it's not suitable for your vegetables. Okay, another poll before we talk about particular crops. Yes, let's go to poll number two. We're curious, this is another select all that apply. We're curious uh, what you're currently growing. So select any of these, which of the following typical winter crops are you currently growing in your garden, your home garden, broccoli, cauliflower. Oops, let me launch the poll versus just reading it to you. There we go. Broccoli, cauliflower, onions, garlic, carrots, kale, chard, beets or cover crops. So check all that you are currently growing. We're curious what's been planted out there from our audience. So go ahead and cast your vote, our votes, and we'll give everyone a few minutes to reply. We've got about two thirds of you cast in your vote and climbing. Lots of choices there. I know. Lots of delicious things, huh? <laughs> All right. Looks like the votes have slowed down. 
So I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and share it with all of you. So it looks like very popular um, green kale is our winner, our most popular currently grown with, at 40%. Uh, there's a couple number of others that came on see 30% with broccoli close third is onions and garlic and carrots um, oh, also chard so a lot of the greens uh, beets 21% are doing cover crops and about 18% are doing cauliflower so quite a variety and 19% uh, said none of the above all right I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing the results and then it will take a just a few seconds to be able to advance to the next slide. Okay, let's see if it goes any quicker this time. This time I'll just start with what we're gonna talk about next. We're gonna go to the crops that grow well in our county during the winter months. Uh, and I'll just preview that by telling you that in Contra Costa County, there are really three different general periods of time when you plant uh, winter crops. Uh, some of them uh, are best planted in the late summer, so August and September timeframe, and we'll be talking about some of those first. Uh, then there are some that are perfect. You're, if you haven't started them yet, uh, your timing's perfect because you have a couple of weeks to start uh, another group of crops. And then finally, we're gonna finish up with talking about some crops that you can start um, next February. Uh, we'll also talk about some of the common problems with the crops. And now let's see if I'm successful in getting the pole to move off. Now it's being obstinate again. Ah, here we go. So mm -hmm. crops to grow in contra cost in the winter months. Okay. So we're gonna start with uh, some where frankly, if you don't yet have these in your garden, save your money because they're not gonna do well this year if you try to start them now in mid-October. And those include ones that were growing uh, the plant to be able to harvest their immature flowers, your cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage, and Romanesco. The, um, the reason that they're not going to do well is that um, these plants, after you put them into your garden as seedlings, they need between 60 and 90 days, depending on the variety, to grow large enough that the, um, they're gonna be large plants and enough stored energy for the plant to be able to produce a very large head of broccoli. If you plant them too late, if you took a four inch uh, uh, seedling uh, pot of broccoli and you put it in your garden tomorrow, I'm gonna predict what you would get is a tiny little head, uh, if anything, unless you really got lucky and next, uh, and it survives the winter okay, and next February it starts growing and produces for you. Uh, but you're going to be better off uh, not planting that seedling tomorrow. Uh, instead, plant it next February. Uh, the, uh, and let me just warn you, if you went to the nurseries, chances are you would find seedlings right now. Uh, get yourself uh, a good planting guide and always check. We have planting guides for Contra Costa County on our Master Gardener website. Uh, there'll be links to them on the presentation handout. Be sure you look. Don't trust the nurseries. They're in the business of selling plants. And if you're willing to buy the four inch uh, seedling tomorrow and put it in your garden, they're happy to have you buy it. Uh, instead, wait until next February uh, and uh, plant your seedlings then. It's also too late to plant many of the root crops. Uh, right now. Uh, if you live in the, um, west, the western part of Contra Costa uh, County, where you have a lot of marine influence, uh, Richmond, El Cerrito, uh, uh, Rodeo, that whole area, uh, it's great for uh, growing your winter crops 
but you have to get them in the uh, get them planted early. So for both the carrots and the beets, uh, the proper time to be planting those in West County would have been in uh, last August uh, or even a little earlier. Keep in mind that means when you're planting your summer garden next year, think what you're gonna plant for a winter garden and be sure you're thinking ahead for where your broccoli can go in in West County, it also needs to go in in August, ideally. Uh, in uh, where I live in Pleasant Hill and the, that central part of the county and the uh, more eastern part, uh, you could do your broccoli into September. You could probably get away with carrots into September. Beets are going to be a bit of a problem. Beets don't like daytime temperatures over 75 degrees. And I haven't seen a high of 75 degrees in Pleasant Hill since last springtime. Uh, so uh, you're lucky if you live in the more coastal areas. Yeah, you've had a few days uh, where it's gotten pretty hot over there, but in general, your daytime temperatures uh, stay below 75 degrees. And that's when beets are gonna do better. Uh, if you live in central or the eastern part of the county, you might get away with planting a fall crop uh, in September, uh, but try it instead in February where the daytime temperatures are cooler and they'll probably do better for you. Now, if you wanna plant something tomorrow and you haven't uh, yet planted these crops, all of the alliums are good crops uh, to plant uh, in October. Don't wait much beyond October, uh, but if you get them in in the next couple of weeks, you can plant garlic. Uh, uh, again, uh, you got to keep in mind what you're going to plant uh, in your summer garden, because if you plant your garlic tomorrow, uh, you're going to be harvesting it uh, next June. Uh, that's going to be later than you're going to want to put tomato seedlings in or pepper seedlings, for example. Those usually are ready to go in the garden sometime during the month of May. Uh, so plan ahead. Put your garlic where you're going to put your green beans because they'll grow quickly and you can start uh, green bean seeds um, after you harvest the garlic. If you haven't planted garlic before, give it a try. Uh, do buy the certified disease-free bulbs from a nursery. Uh, the, if you planted ones from the grocery store, they would grow, but you do take a risk uh, that you might be introducing diseases into the garden. Easy to plant the garlic. Uh, first of all, be sure you do your soil tests. Garlic and all the other alliums are very heavy nitrogen users. So be sure you start with some nitrogen fertilizer, some of that organic uh, type fertilizer if you're low in nitrogen. Uh, because the garlics are gonna take a long time, six months uh, to uh, be ready for harvest, check again about next February or March. If the leaves of the garlic are turning yellow, it might be time for some additional nitrogen at that point. Uh, also, when you break your bulbs apart, uh, plant the biggest ones. They're going to uh, produce the largest uh, heads of garlic. And then be patient. It takes the garlic longer than it's going to take your green onions. If you planted green onion seeds tomorrow, you could probably start harvesting uh, some of the green onions as early as December. And leeks, if you plant them tomorrow, could be uh, harvested in March. Uh, but the garlic is going to take until June. It'll tell you when it's ready. Uh, the uh, tops are going to start falling over, uh, turning a little brown. When that happens, turn off your irrigation, let them sit so the soil dries a bit. Then you're going to harvest them, let them sit out in a cool shaded area outside for a week or so, and then you can uh, cut off the roots like you see uh, in the photo. You can either cut off the tops like you see, or they make pretty decorations if you braid them together. So good time for the garlic. Also a good time for the leeks, the green onions. Um, but I don't suggest you're trying to plant 
onions right now that you hope are gonna produce bulbs because it's very common for onions to produce a lot of flowers instead of uh, producing nice large onion bulbs. Let me tell you a little bit uh, why that happens so you know how to avoid it. One reason it happens, I made this mistake when I first started uh, trying to grow onions in the Bay Area. I bought sets like the little ones that you see in the photograph on the uh, screen. Those sets are actually one-year-old onion bulbs. Uh, onions are a biennial plant. A lot of the vegetables we grow in the winter are annuals. You plant your cauliflower, planted it last September, you're probably going to harvest it no later than February, and then the plant is done. It's not going to produce another head of um, cauliflower, even if you leave it in the soil. So you might as well take it out at that point because it's an annual. It goes through its life cycle in one season. You took away its flower, the cauliflower. Uh, it's not gonna produce anything more. But the onions are biannuals. So they want to go through two complete growing se seasons. The way the little sets are produced are the sellers uh, actually uh, plant seeds, they intentionally crowd them together, uh, trying to get little bulbs that form, but uh, stay small. They let them dry out, they cut off the tops, and they sell them to you. You plant them, uh, and what does the onion want to do? It wants to go through its second growing season and produce flowers. So if you're growing these, uh, they're a quick way to get green onions, and they're sure a lot easier to plant uh, than the little seeds, but just be sure you use them as green onions. Don't uh, plant too many for you to use them up before uh, they start uh, going to flower, because once they flower, the onion itself really becomes inedible. Uh, you could eat the flowers if you wanted. Uh, the same thing sometimes happens even if you plant seeds. This won't happen every year, but it happens many years. And it's all uh, related to our microclimates. So think about planting your onion seeds tomorrow in October. Today in my backyard, it was over 90 degrees. They're going to get started. It'll take a while for them to germinate, but they'll grow. I'll be able to start harvesting some green onions sometime in the month of December. Uh, and uh, then uh, let's say by late December, we have some of those very cold nights. It gets down to 28 degrees in the backyard for one or two nights. And then uh, the weather comes back to our norms again. And in fact, by January, maybe we even have uh, a day or two that it gets into the 70s. And then it turns cold again. Well, that tricks the onions into thinking that they've gone through two complete seasons because it was warm, it got cold, got warm again. Uh, and now they're wanting to start their second season. So I usually find if I try to start the um, onions in uh, October, for big bulbs, sometimes I get them, but sometimes a fair percentage of those bulbs are gonna go to flower instead. So plant them in February, that's my recommendation. Uh, buy them at that point as little seedlings. You'll find four inch pots of lots of little seedlings uh, in the nurseries in February, or you could start your own onions inside uh, as soon as the seed catalogs come out in December, early January, uh, so they're ready to go into the garden in February, uh, then I predict that um, about next June, June 21st in particular, you'll see the onion bulbs start swelling. And as long as you've given them good care and enough room, you're going to get nice bulbs. I know it's going to be June 21st because the bulbing of onions is dependent on the amount of daylight hours. Now, this isn't sunlight. I've already told you earlier that you can grow a root crop like onions uh, in four to six hours. 
But in order to start swelling those bulbs, they need at least 12 hours of daylight. And some varieties will need as many as 15 hours of daylight. They're daylight sensitive. So I can pretty much predict by uh, June 21st, the summer solstice, uh, the day that we get the most hours of sunlight in the whole year, that's when you're gonna see the bulbs start uh, swelling. And then it'll take them, uh, that'll be June 21st, um, a few weeks later, uh, it'll be time to start thinking about harvesting them. Now, if you've had trouble with bulbs and you wanna start something right now that is going to grow into a nice bulb, try shallots. Uh, for all the years that I was unsuccessful and grew flowers instead of onion bulbs, uh, every year I had success with the shallots. Again, start with certified uh, bulbs uh, from a nursery, so you're not introducing uh, any diseases. Uh, each of the larger size bulbs you see on the right of the screen, if you break it apart much like you do a garlic bulb, you get the smaller little uh, shallots that you see on the left. In fact, these are the ones that are going into my garden, uh, hopefully in the next couple of days, because I don't have them planted yet. But you uh, plant uh, the little bulblets, uh, pointed end goes up, other end is the root end. Uh, put them on about an inch and a half, two inches under your soil. Uh, and each of those little bulblets is going to produce a cluster of bulbs. Now, the ones you're seeing up here, these are bulbs. Uh, I bought the original bulbs that I grow about seven years ago. I've never had problems with diseases. I've always gotten good production and I always set some outside. Uh, if you plant them in the next week or so, you'll be harvesting them in May. Keep them in a cool, dry, dark location and they will stay good both for use in your kitchen until next October and for replanting for a, a crop next year. The other thing you can plant right now are any of the crops that are going to uh, be grown so you can harvest their leaves. These are all what are called commonly come and come again crops. Uh, as long as you don't harvest the entire plant, uh, don't take that whole uh, uh, lettuce just take the more uh, the older, more mature leaves off of the outside of the plant. And that's true for the spinach and the char and the kale as well. Uh, the in inner uh, younger leaves are gonna be plenty to photosynthesize and keep that plant growing. And particularly in the winter months when it's cool and you're not gonna get a lot of bolting with flowers forming, if you plant these now, uh, you'll still be able to harvest them when you're putting in your tomatoes next uh, May. Uh, right now, I would recommend you use seedlings rather than seeds. You would have wanted to start the seeds a few weeks ago. In addition to lettuces and spinach and char and kale, uh, another thing that you could plant right now are seedlings of uh, uh, parsley, uh, cilantro, dill, all of those that are so much a challenge to grow in the summer, they're fantastic growers in the winter and they won't be going to seed. The other thing you could plant right now would be any type of uh, garden peas, the snap peas, snow peas, or the English shelling peas. Uh, good time to plant them. Uh, you can get seedlings now, but uh, you can also plant your seeds Soak them overnight before you plant. Be sure you read the label of your seed package for two reasons. One is that uh, peas are very susceptible to powdery mildew. Um, if you had a summer uh, uh, squashes, uh, zucchinis and the like, or other winter squashes, you know powdery mildew because everybody gets it. There, it doesn't affect the quality of what you're harvesting from the plant, but for the sugar snap peas, it can. So it's best, particularly in the winter months, uh, to plant uh, seeds that are resistant to powdery mildew. 
read the package, it'll tell you whether or not it's got that resistance. The other thing you need to pay attention to are uh, peas come either as a bush style that are only gonna grow maybe 12, 14 inches uh, tall and produce their peas, or they'll come on a one that wants to have a trellis to grow on. Uh, so the bush beans, uh, you don't need a trellis. Uh, if it's not a bush bean, put your trellis uh, in at the same time you're planting your seeds uh, because uh, you don't want to have to install it later for those plants to have some place to grow because you may disturb their roots. Okay, now we're ready to talk about February. We've already talked about the fact you can plant your onion seedlings to create uh, bulbing onions in February. Just be sure uh, that you get um, uh, your seeds started in advance, unless you're gonna go to the nursery to get your little seedlings, because that's what you wanna plant in February. Potatoes, um, when you go to the nurseries in February, you're gonna see what now has become dozens of varieties of seed potatoes that you can plant. So you can uh, try out some brand new varieties that uh, may not even be available in the grocery stores, although they're carrying more and more varieties. Uh, they're fun to plant. I do recommend that you plant it in some kind of a container rather than planting it directly in a garden bed or a raised bed. The reason is uh, potatoes produce lots of little potatoes and if you've got them in your uh, garden beds directly, you're never gonna be able to find them all. And they'll come back as a volunteer. Uh, they'll be crowding your summer plants if you let them grow. And you also risk um, uh, introducing uh, diseases to your soil if you allow them to grow in the same location uh, season after season. Uh, but they, they grow well in containers. You can even use recycled plastic bags. For example, if you've got a uh, two cubic feet of potting mix or compost in a plastic bag, uh, just turn it down like you see in the photo, put some slits in the bottom along the side for drainage. Uh, then you're going to plant your seed potatoes in the bottom, probably only in the plastic bag, maybe four or five, depending on the size of the variety uh, of potato you're growing. Um, I'm not gonna give you all the how-tos, but I did include on the presentation handout a link to a blog that one of my co-master gardeners wrote a few years ago telling you the process for growing potatoes in containers. So take a look at that. Uh, you'll find if you do it right, those four or five uh, seed potatoes you start in the plastic bag, they'll probably produce close to 10 pounds of uh, potatoes for you. Uh, also in February, uh, if you missed uh, planting the carrots uh, a couple months ago, a uh, good time to plant them again in February. Same with the beets. Uh, the carrot seeds are tiny. Uh, and they are almost impossible to pick up one at a time. And when you do pick them up one at a time, uh, it's hard to see where you've placed them. I like to plant in a container. Uh, it, I find I can uh, control the texture of the potting mix better. So I don't run the risk of the carrots uh, encountering uh, uh, a lot of clay soil. Uh, they grow better, uh, they grow great in containers. I've got them growing right now on my front porch. Uh, but the, to avoid the, the tiny uh, seed problem, here's a couple of solutions that I've used. Uh, for many years, I used pelleted carrot seeds as shown on the left. They put a little coating, kind of a clay-like coating, dissolves easily in water. But the only reason for that coating on a pelleted carrot seed is to make it easier to pick up and place because you don't want to crowd your carrots or you won't get good production. They're going to uh, be small. Uh, they may even be interlocked a bit if you uh, plant them too close and aren't really diligent about getting rid of the extras. 
So you can use the pelleted seeds and place them. Uh, take a look at your uh, uh, seed package and it'll tell you how close to plant them. Now I did that for many years, but then I learned that pelleted seeds, one of the drawbacks is that they don't uh, last very long for reliable germination. Your natural seeds, the tiny ones, uh, you can have a uh, package of carrot seed, and if you store it properly in a cool, dry, dark location, uh, you can keep that carrot seed for three or four years and it will reliably germinate. Pelleted seeds, only one year uh, is all the uh, seed sellers are going to back as far as its germination uh, because the pelleting process uh, takes some of the vitality away from the seed. Uh, when I learned that, uh, I didn't like the fact that I was always going to have uh, pelleted seeds that I didn't plant and they didn't get used. So I did a little research and I found out how to make my own uh, seed tape. I simply take a piece of paper towel. Uh, these are cut about three quarters inches wide, six inches long. Uh, you might notice that I actually put a ruler uh, in the photograph uh, and every three inches I put, I tried to put one carrot seed. Sometimes it's two because they're so hard to pick up. If you've got two and they both start, uh, uh, do the right thing and take your little tiny scissors and cut one of them off so they don't crowd. But these you can simply put, uh, in my case, this is how I planted all of the carrots I've got growing in, growing in a container on my front porch. Just laid them out so they're three inches apart because that's what my seed package told me. Um, I covered them up with about a half an inch of potting mix, uh, kept them well moist. Uh, the moisture, uh, the seeds, by the way, are held in place with some uh, washable, uh, water-soluble glue, the kind of glue that a kindergarten kid would be using um, in kindergarten. Uh, it dissolves uh, when you add moisture uh, to your planting area, and uh, eventually the uh, paper towel is just going to disappear. So these, uh, for me this year, um, I started all my carrots this way. They've come up very reliable. Uh, just be aware, carrots take about three weeks to germinate. They must be kept um, moist that whole time. If you allow the top of your container to, to go dry, um, even re-wetting, it's not gonna do any good. So check it a couple times a day, be sure you've got plenty of moisture and then be patient uh, waiting for them to come up. Okay, so if you miss the window for broccoli, uh, you can plant it next February, just plan ahead. Uh, what I would recommend is when the seed catalogs come out, buy yourself some broccoli seed, uh, less expensive than buying the seedlings. And I'm a little afraid that some of the nurseries uh, might actually just have leftover seedlings that didn't sell in the fall. So for the best uh, results, uh, get those started in late December, or early January. So they'll be ready to uh, go into your garden by mid-February. But then watch for this. Uh, it's very common uh, if you are a subscriber to the uh, San Francisco Chronicle, you just read Pam Pierce had a, a column about the cabbage worm butterfly and the fact that vegetable gardeners hate this little butterfly, uh, even though all other gardeners think, well, isn't that a pretty little butterfly? Well, what's happening is every time that pretty little butterfly lands on your broccoli, your kale, any of the other brassica family, uh, it's going to lay a little egg. Uh, it's going to, within a few days, if the weather's warm, it's going to hatch into a tiny little caterpillar, initially only about a quarter of an inch long, uh, blends in with the color of the leaf, uh, they're tiny at that stage, but they're voracious eaters and they grow very quickly. With weather like we've got right now, for those of you that have already planted your broccoli, if you've got these critters, just beware 
that probably in as little as a week to 10 days, they'll go from being an egg to being a caterpillar, to leave the plant, to form their chrysalis, their cocoon, in a couple of days hatching out as another butterfly, starting the process all over again. So what to do? One is look for them and pick them off. Uh, but there is, in the case of caterpillars uh, eating your plants, there is actually a very low toxicity pesticide that is approved. On the right-hand side of the slide uh, is actually a copy from the uh, uh, University of California's IPM website uh, talking about the pesticide information for BT spray. That's what kills the caterpillars. And as you'll see, um, it's very low toxicity for you and me, for our pets, uh, for bees. It's not gonna hurt any of the beneficial insects. The only thing that it's going to do damage to is the caterpillar. That's because uh, of the way that it's applied. BT stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. That's one of the bacteria, one of the good guy bacteria that is present in your soils. But the pesticide manufacturers discovered that they can synthesize that and put it in the form of a pesticide that's very low toxicity uh, and is very effective at making the caterpillars ill. They're eating the bacteria, it makes them ill uh, within uh, hours after they have consumed the BT spray that you use. Uh, they're going to quit eating your plant and within a couple of days they will die. Uh, so uh, BT spray is low toxicity, very effective for caterpillars. The big drawback is that it's a bacteria once you've activated it and sprayed it on your plants, you have to be very thorough about spraying all of the leaf surfaces where the uh, caterpillars are feeding so that they do consume it. But the um, bacteria that's gonna kill the uh, caterpillar only remains viable for at most a couple of days. So every three or four days, you've got to respray. I'm a lazy gardener, here's my solution. As soon as I put seedlings of any of the brassicas, the cauliflowers, cabbages, broccoli, kale, I immediately cover my plants, the seedlings with a row cover. I like to use the shade cloth like you see on the left. Uh, that way I can see the plant, uh, see what's going on. I have occasionally, uh, planted seedlings that I didn't realize already had uh, the eggs of the caterpillars. So pay attention. You can use the shade cloth on the left or you can use an agribond row cover on the right. You're probably gonna have to buy uh, either shade cloth or the row covers uh, online. Uh, what's carried locally in big box stores and nurseries tends to be too dense, doesn't let enough light through. If you want a shade cloth or a row cover that allows about 80% of the light to go through, that'll be enough uh, to allow your crops to continue to grow and to do their photosynthesis. But if you put a, a heavier cover uh, over, like the covers they sell locally that look like the row cover, they're usually the the stuff sold locally is intended for frost protection, for covering up your citrus, for example, on a cold night, doesn't let enough light through. Uh, here's another challenge if you plant in February in particular, if the temperatures get above about 80 degrees and your broccoli is forming its head, uh, it's a flower and the buds of the flower are gonna open. Once it happens, uh, it's not gonna slow down. You might as well go ahead and harvest and use the head. The other good news, particularly if you get a lot of flowers before you notice what's going on, is they're very edible. Um, I had a sister visiting last uh, February from Idaho. Of course, they can't grow broccoli in Idaho in February, but I was. But some of it was starting to open 
and she discovered how pretty those flowers look um, sprinkled over the top of a green salad. Okay, time for questions. Okay, um, thank you, Terry. We have a number of questions. So we're gonna take about a five minute uh, question and answer session and we have another one at the end. So going back to the beginning of the presentation when we were talking about um, soil testing, the question was approximately how much does a soil test cost if you were to send it away? They range. Um, I got the photos by um, looking online and probably between maybe a low of $15 and a high of $25. They are available in, in uh, nurseries. I've certainly seen them there and maybe in the big box stores, but uh, lots of sources available online as well. Perfect, great, thank you. Um, so a question came up, um, what, where can you buy onion or leek starts? Uh, well, the in, the onion seedlings, um, I've seen in lots of different nurseries, uh, but not this time of year. Uh, typically, they would be available um, for the onions in February. When I've grown leeks, I've always used seeds. They grow well from seeds, so I've never looked for um, for the leeks, but I would bet that you might find them at the at the same time, maybe in the fall, but again, I, I just use seeds, less expensive, they grow well, so you might as well use seeds rather than the seedlings for the leeks in particular. Okay. Uh, the seedlings I recommend just if you wanna plant in February for bulbing onions. Otherwise, right now you could plant onion seeds and uh, uh, be able to harvest from them uh, for your green onions. Great, okay, great. So um, there's a problem in the garden. Somebody said they, a couple of them. Uh, the first one is about broccoli. Um, one of our participants said they tried growing broccoli a couple years ago, but the broccoli was just completely overcome with aphids. They tried washing it off to no luck. Any suggestions on how to handle um, such a massive yeah. aphid infestation? You know, on, onion or um, uh, aphids are very temperature sensitive. Now, I, I'm a little bit surprised. Uh, it it kind of depends on when you were growing it. Uh, aphids, in my experience, on the um, brassica or cold crops are more of a problem in the springtime because the temperatures tend to be warmer. Uh, in, in fact, for our Master Gardener program, uh, uh, when we do our classes for new master gardeners, there's one day that is presented by an entomologist and she would put out a request, does anybody have aphids on their brassicas? And many years she had a hard time finding them in the fall. So um, my recommendation to minimize the chances would be to plant your uh, broccoli seedlings in August if you live in West County, uh, in early, in late August or early September, if you live in uh, either central or eastern part of the county, um, and then really watch for the aphids. Um, avoid any kind of pesticides other than BT spray um, in your garden. Uh, the big savior for uh, uh, getting rid of the aphids are beneficial insects. You will diminish the beneficial insects if you are spraying pesticides. So I don't even spray a, um, a, a soap-based uh, pesticide. I use water exclusively uh, for aphids. Uh, when I used to live in Oakland, and I uh, was a less experienced gardener. I used uh, what were low toxicity pesticides but I had a much bigger problem then because I think I was killing some of the beneficials. Um, I don't spray anything uh, pesticide related other than occasionally BT spray in my garden in Pleasant Hill, and it's been considerably less. Now, if you've been using pesticides, you're gonna have to wait uh, for a couple of years for your beneficial uh, insects to really build up again and just avoid spraying any uh, kind of pesticides that might injure them. 
Okay, great. I think we have time for one more question and we'll try to get to the others at the end. This uh, participant talked about um, experience growing beets. They grew in the same raised bed, both red and golden beets. Um, they had plenty of red beets, but very few golden beets. They were curious, is it more difficult to grow golden beets than other varieties? It shouldn't be. Um, you pay attention to things like uh, days to maturity. It might be that uh, there was just different uh, amount of time required for those, uh, uh, the gold ones to grow big enough or other cultural uh, requirements. Uh, but in general, if you can successfully get the red beets to grow, you should be able to get the, the gold ones to grow as well. Okay. Great. All right, we'll save the rest for the end and we'll let you get on with your next part. And let's okay, see if we have so, a poll. Um, I'm going to skip the poll just okay. because I, I don't want us to be waiting again. Perfect. The poll was just going to be here was the poll question true or false? Uh, it's beneficial to your garden from time to time to leave the garden beds empty so that your soils can rest. True or false? Now, the answer is false, and it, it, it is false because of something I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation when we were talking about healthy soils. Uh, the plants that are growing in your garden beds are actually helping provide food for the beneficial microorganisms that are in a healthy soil. I answered a question earlier this year on our help desk. A person uh, wrote in saying that uh, she was trying to grow tomatoes. She sent me pictures of her tomatoes. They look pitiful. She said, I didn't have a summer garden last year because I decided to let my beds rest. And then I learned she'd also let them rest through the following winter. So nothing had been growing in her beds uh, from the time the prior summer when she took out the summer crop. So nearly a year, nothing growing. She had killed off all the beneficial microorganisms in her garden. So instead of letting your uh, garden rest empty, if you don't fill it with crops, fill it with cover crops. It's much better for your soil health and frankly, they're much prettier to look at than empty beds that are uh, full of debris from your summer crops. So I'm going to talk now about what grows well as a cover crop in our county in the winter months. And you have two kind of classes to choose from, legumes or grains. And they're all good for your soils, but for a little different reasons. I'm going to start with the legumes. Uh, what you see pictured here on the left is vetch, B-E-T-C-H. Uh, then the next one is red clover. There are different colors of clover. Uh, the, both the vetch and the clover, if you plant them uh, in the next couple of weeks, and again, the next couple of weeks is your best opening this year for winter cover crops if you don't already have them in the garden. Uh, if you get them planted in October by uh, probably early February, they'll be in blossom. It's a wonderful pollen source for, uh, for bees at that time of year where there are limited flowers available. Uh, the third picture on the slide are field peas. Uh, they're even prettier than the sugar snacks you grow uh, to eat yourself because they come in a variety of colors and again are good for the bees. And then on the right are fava beans. Now, the reason you uh, grow legumes is that they have a special ability to fix nitrogen in the root nodules. On the screen, you can actually see the little nodules on fava bean roots at the top and even the clover roots at the bottom. The green arrows are pointing to them on the clover roots. Uh, basically, the, the plant acts in conjunction with bacteria in your soils to be able to uh, put these nodules together. They're full of nitrogen. 
reason the plant is doing it is it wants to be able to use that nitrogen as the uh, flowers are turning into pods for your fava bean or the flowers on your clover are setting seed. But the strategy for a cover crop is you're gonna harvest your cover crop after the nodules have formed, uh, but uh, you know, you're gonna cut it off uh, so that instead of letting the plant use it, you leave it in your soils and then it's available for next summer's crop. If you did uh, all legumes as cover crops in your beds, chances are if you did uh, a soil test uh, before you planted your tomatoes, you would find that at the point you're putting the seedlings in, there would be plenty of nitrogen if you grew legume cover crops. Now the grains are also good for the um, soils, but for a different reason. The kind of grains that you could grow are actually ones that if you let them go to maturity, you could harvest them, uh, figure out how to mill the seed uh, and uh, bake bread. But if you're doing a cover crop, it's for a different purpose. Uh, and, but you can grow all of the, uh, the cereal crops, the rye, barley, and oats are shown in the picture. Buckwheat is shown um, on the right-hand lower part. That uh, is a good cover crop, but it's not one you would wanna plant right now. So stay away from buckwheat right now. But if you've got cauliflower growing and you harvest next February, buckwheat is an excellent grain crop to plant and it is very fast to produce. So if you planted it in February, you could have the benefits of the cover crop and have it harvested with your uh, uh, garden beds ready to go for your tomatoes in May. Uh, so what the uh, uh, grains do is that if you look and see how much mass is growing above ground, there's an equal amount of mass in the form of roots underground. And when you're growing these cover crops, uh, they grow very deep, the roots, and what you're doing is when you harvest a cover crop, you're gonna cut it off at the soil level and you're gonna leave those roots in the ground. You're adding a significant amount of organic material. And as the roots are growing in your clay soils, it's gonna help uh, break them up, help uh, avoid the compaction. If you have um, sandy soils, I live in a little area of Pleasant Hill where our bedrock is sandstone. So my native soils are sandy and they drain very quickly. The benefit of a grain crop in particular is all that root mass that you leave in the soil is going to help the soils um, retain more moisture and not drain as quickly. Or you can use a mix. Uh, the, what's shown in the photo is a mix of rye, clover, uh, a, uh, pea, a few fill pea, and in this case, they uh, planted daikon radish. I put a separate picture at the bottom of the uh, screen there on the right uh, that shows a daikon radish. It's a taproot, grows very vigorously and very deep, and what you're going to do is uh, when you harvest the cover crop, you would cut it off it would be great for breaking up uh, clay soils because it would be able, uh, it's a strong grower and could penetrate pretty deep into your clay soils. Now, if you're gonna uh, do cover crops, you're gonna be starting with seeds. Um, I have found in a limited number of nurseries, I found cover crop seeds, they're widely available online. Uh, call to your nursery, ask if they've got them. If they don't, maybe if they get calls, they'll be encouraged in future years to have them. If you don't find them in your local nursery, um, if you want to plant the, them this year, get them ordered online right away so that you have time before the end of October to get them started. Uh, the seed size depends on what you're growing. Um, if you're uh, growing the uh, legumes, the other thing you need to be aware of is that in order to form all those nice nitrogen nodules, 
You need to be sure that the soils have got the right kind of bacteria. So when you buy your uh, seeds, check to see if you can get the inoculant. I have found fava seeds uh, for many years in local nurseries because I've grown them as a food crop for many years, but I've never seen the inoculant. You might have to get that online. Uh, the, uh, it's easy to apply. You simply wet the seeds, comes in a powdered form. You sprinkle it on like you see in the, uh, in the bowl. Then get those uh, seeds planted right away. Don't let them sit out and wait until tomorrow once you've moistened uh, them and applied the uh, inoculant. Uh, the, the inoculant is actually bacteria. It's beneficial bacteria. It's great for uh, the soils. It will help the plants form the nodules, but it will start dying off if exposed to the light and the air and the heat of the sun. So get them planted right after you get them inoculated. Uh, some seed comes pre-coated. Uh, on the right-hand part of the screen are a mix of clovers that I'm planting in uh, some of my beds this year. Uh, and they came pre-coated uh, with the required inoculant. It's called nitro coating. Uh, the larger seeds like fava beans or peas, you're gonna plant just like you were uh, planting a food crop, read the label to see what the spacing and depth requirements are. For the small seeds, for all of your grains, for uh, vetch or for club clover, you can just broadcast it and then cover it with uh, quarter to a half inch of, uh, of soil over the top, moisten it like any seeds, uh, they want to stay moist uh, while they're germinating. Um, and then when it comes time to harvest, um, I'm going to give you uh, some options uh, of what you do. In all cases, you're going to want to cut the plant down at roughly at the soil level and leave all of the roots in the ground. You can see from the photograph that there's as many roots underneath the surface as there is uh, biomass on the top. And you're gonna leave all those roots. For your legumes, you're leaving the nitrogen. For the grains, it's a wonderful uh, addition of additional organic material for your soils, which will benefit your soils. Uh, you can cut it down with uh, hand equipment, like uh, if you've got a sickle or scythe, you could use that, or you can do uh, as Andrea's daughter did at the uh, one of the community gardens. She's harvesting cover crops uh, using some head shears and just cutting it all down. Uh, you could also uh, use a weed whacker uh, as power equipment if you wanted to do that. And then you're gonna end up with a lot of top biomass. What do you do with it? I'm gonna give you four alternatives. I'm gonna start with the one I least recommend and end with uh, telling you what I plan to do next spring and what we've been doing um, in our demonstration garden for the Master Gardener program. One choice is to till it in. The photo shows using a garden fork uh, you can do that. It's a lot of work. Uh, you know, a lot of the organic farms use uh, power equipment. You could use a rototiller, but remember back to what you heard in some of our prior webinars. Uh, you want to disturb the uh, microbes in your soil as little as possible. Some of the microbes live just under the surface of the soil. Some uh, live deeper. When you till, either with a fork or with a rototiller, you're mixing them all up, and that's not particularly good for the uh, organisms. So you can do this uh, uh, by burying it, by tilling. It tends to break down a little faster, but you don't need to do that. Another choice would be to cut it all off, cut it into small pieces, add it to compost. Uh, it's a green. You'll need to balance it with an equal amount of uh, the browns. Uh, we're starting now to have leaf fall off of our trees. It's a great time to collect the leaves. 
if you uh, used uh, all of the cover crop biomass uh, plus leaves in your compost, you might even get a hot compost because you'd have a lot of material to put in all at one time. Uh, but um, uh, it, the problem with doing that is uh, eventually you take it back to the garden, but you're not adding it back immediately. You can also simply use it as a mulch, like is shown in the photo here. Mulches are very important for vegetable gardens, uh, in particular in the summer. It's really important to mulch uh, beneath where your uh, vegetables are growing. It'll keep the temperature of your soil down. There'll be less evaporation. It'll help suppress any weeds from coming back. So you can use it as a mulch. If you're growing some summer or uh, winter crops in some of your beds and uh, cover crops in others, you could spread it between uh, both beds so that you don't have as much uh, in any one location. Or here's what has been going on with uh, uh, cover crops at our garden, the demonstration garden that we run in uh, the Shadelands area of Walnut Creek. Uh, they cut down the crop. They then remove it and we've got uh, power shredders that they run it through so that it's in very small pieces. They put it back on the garden bed. They cover it with two or three inches of compost. Then they cover the compost with burlap bags. Uh, burlap bags are available from coffee roasters. They're not supposed to send them to the uh, landfills because they foul up the uh, equipment. So they love to give them away so you can get burlap or alternatively, just get some cardboard boxes. Save the ones that if you're ordering online, save some of those boxes. Uh, you're gonna cover up the compost. You're gonna moisten it and keep it moist for three or four weeks. Uh, if you have done composting, you see we're kind of creating the same uh, situation right in the garden bed as we did uh, in a compost pile. Uh, and then uh, at the end of three or four weeks, you can remove the cover and plant your crops. Uh, just move it aside and make planting holes for whatever you're planting like you see in the photograph. Uh, be careful, by the way, for um, you want to be sure to get the value of the nodules that you uh, cut down your uh, legume cover crops before they start sitting pods. And for your clovers and vetch, be sure you do it before they start uh, changing the flower to seeds, because if you scatter those tiny seeds, they will restart and there'll be a bit of a uh, invasive weed-like uh, problem in your summer garden. So just get them early enough and then um, use the biomass as uh, uh, a mulch and plant through it. And we're ready for final set of questions. Okay. Um, I know we're a little bit, um, a little bit, we're almost at eight o'clock. So some of you might need to sign off, but uh, we're gonna have a questions for a few minutes. Um, Allison just posted in the um, chat room, um, a link to our voluntary survey. This will just have some brief information. Um, if you're interested in receiving our newsletter, um, receiving Terry's pro handout from this evening, and just a couple questions to find out how you found us tonight, should take about a minute or two. Um, we would love if you could, after this program, fill that out. Um, we could send you the information that um, Terry has listed. We have a, a lot of other great information on our website as well, which includes our planting guides that um, Terry has referenced. So a couple questions kind of looking at the tail end of a summer garden, a um, couple of folks said they still have uh, vegetables in place. So let me, there's a couple questions. Um, should I, the question is, should I take out um, the tomatoes that are still producing right now and plant a winter garden or should I leave them in to grow? Um, I'm gonna guess that if you've got tomatoes still in the bed, if probably has green tomatoes on it, it is very unlikely to set any new tomatoes. I'd almost say it's virtually certain that it won't produce any more this year. Really depends on how you wanna use your garden beds. Uh, 
the uh, they will ripen if you leave them uh, on the plants. It'll be slow going, particularly if the uh, weather uh, cools off much. Uh, what I usually do is um, I cut off the green tomatoes and I put them in a cool, dry place. And frankly, sometimes I've done that with enough of them and they ripen slowly. They're not as delicious as uh, fresh off the vine ripe ones, but they're as good as the ones you could get in the grocery store. And I've served them at, in December uh, out of the summer garden by just setting them aside. Separate them because you, um, if any of them starts rotting a little bit, if they're uh, up against each other, it'll spread. Uh, there are some others, like I left a pepper plant in last year, Pepper and tomatoes are both perennials. Tomatoes are very cold sensitive. Pepper's a little less so. We didn't have any frost in Pleasant Hill last winter at all. Uh, my pepper survived the entire winter. And by uh, April and May, it was uh, putting out uh, peppers again. It's continuing to put out peppers. So it's the only uh, summer crop vegetable that I've still got in my garden and it's now going on its second year. Great. So for some of those folks who might just be getting ready to clean out their summer garden and interested in planting a cover crop, a question came up. Do you leave the roots in place when you're getting rid of those? Um, can you- Yeah, for your summer things? crops. Yeah. yeah. You know, some of it, right at the very base of the tomato, I, I find is, is pretty big. So sometimes I kind of break that up a little bit, but it's a good thing always when you're harvesting uh, crops out of your garden, taking the plants out, Try to leave as much of the root biomass as you can. It's a wonderful way of adding additional organic material to your soils. Perfect, thank you. A couple questions came in. Is um, if interested in planting both a winter garden and cover crops, can you plant winter um, vegetables and sprinkle um, or plant cover crops around them? You probably could. I would then suggest some of the plants, I wouldn't suggest fava beans unless you plan for proper spacing. If you're growing a broccoli, for example, already, uh, it's gonna be pretty big by the time it's ready to harvest. You may not have room for the fava beans, but you probably could uh, grow some clover below it or maybe some of the grain crops. I neglected to say the grain crops, you're gonna wanna harvest them and cut them off when they're about a foot tall. Perfect. Yeah, and somebody had asked about that. So that, that you just knocked off another question. Thank you. Good. <laughs> um, couple more. Um, so these are a couple questions folks had about beneficial insects. Going back to BT, so I'll, I'll kind of rattle both of them off. Question is, does BT hurt beneficial insects? And then also somebody said they've used tobacco tea um, to fight off aphids, and they're curious if that hurts beneficials. Um, as to the, it, for t tobacco leaf, is that what you said? Tobacco tea. Huh, I, I don't know about that. The, um, as master gardeners, we simply rely on the uh, advice from the University of California. It's all research-based. And I know that that's not one that the University of California would endorse. Uh, but as to the BT spray, it does not hurt beneficials, no. Perfect, okay, great. A couple questions about, and a comment, or kind of a question about fava beans, and then I think we're about done through the questions. Um, one participant wrote in and said they planted fava beans last year, but the voles completely decimated them. How would you prevent that to have a successful? The voles? Uh-huh. Um, you know, the, there is a link on my handout to the IPM website uh, they, uh, for the University of California. Uh, so you could go in through that and look for voles or simply do an internet search. Uh, controlling voles, comma, UC. And that's going to bring you to a University of California website that will tell you what to do about voles. 
uh, you basically, uh, you've got to use mouse traps and catch them is uh, the top recommendation for the voles. But you can read all about it on the ITM website. Thank you so much, Terry, uh, for all your time and information tonight. And thank you so much. I think we went over 300 between Facebook and Zoom today. So I think that's a record. And we're really glad all of you were able to join in tonight and look forward to seeing you again soon.